uh, we have Steve Gregg with us this morning. He's radio host, amen, uh, of The Narrow Path. Uh, it's on KFIA here locally, uh, but he's all over the country. Um, he's a husband, a dad, a disciple of Jesus, a journeyer, a student, an evangelist, a pastor, an apologist, an artist, a writer, a musician. You tired yet? <laughs> all that stuff? Yeah. Uh, if you go to his website, I love his website. It is full of information. But you know how when you go to a website and you often have just a paragraph or two of a biography. But when you go to Steve's, what I love about Steve's website is this really lengthy biography. And it's a record of his journey with Jesus and, and with the word of God. And, and it, there'll be things like, you know, I thought this way and then I studied some more and I was discipled some more and then I came to this. And rarely do you get a glimpse into somebody like that. And that shows a, a, a humility, a humble heart. Um, and man, I'm telling you, if you start reading the stuff that this guy has on his website, um, come back in about five years, maybe you've read it all, right? It, it's pretty amazing. So Steve, come on up. I want to welcome you. Um, thank you for being with us this morning. I've cut my hair since then. <clears throat> Perhaps for the last time, I don't know. God knows. Well, I, I met your pastor for the first time just Thursday at the Jessup event, and it was delightful. He's obviously a delightful brother, and, uh, and very gracious to invite me to come and share uh, with the congregation this morning. Uh, I think at the website, we, uh, in the announcement about this uh, gathering, it said the subject was to be determined, but uh, actually when I talked to him in, uh, on Thursday, he said he would like for me to speak on the subject of the narrow path, not the radio show, not the website, but the passage in the Bible from which that comes. Uh, and he asked, uh, someone else asked me just this morning, uh, why did you choose that name for the show? By the way, the show's been on the air for 27 years, so I made that decision a long time ago. But I haven't, <clears throat> but I haven't, uh, I haven't changed my mind about the title. Um, it was based on the passage we're going to be looking at right now, and, and basically the reason I chose the narrow path is to emphasize the fact that we're walking, following Jesus, and, and it has, uh, as far as my concern as a teacher, it's mostly to talk about how we walk with Jesus. I mean, there's a lot of theology that comes up because people ask questions about that. I'm comfortable with theological discussions and even debates, but uh, I'm, mainly I believe my mission is uh, to, what Jesus said, teach people to observe all things I've commanded, teach people how to walk with Jesus, to follow the shepherd. And it is a path, obviously. The, the idea of a path is a metaphor. And it comes from uh, Matthew chapter seven. So I'm gonna read a passage here. It's uh, near the end, almost at the very end, of the Sermon on the Mount, beginning with Matthew 7 and verse 13. And by the way, there's another website called Matthew 713 that you might want to look at, too. It has more information than you could ever dream, over, 20, over 25,000 questions that people have asked me on the radio and their answers. So you can look up the questions by, in, it's, there's an alphabetical topical index find the subject, then you'll find the list of questions on that subject. You go to the question you're interested in and click, and it'll play a hyperlink to that very call. So uh, I, I've just been told that I think last, this month, the, the number of calls on there reached 25,000. There's about 2,000 topics. Uh, so that's an incredible website too. And uh, a person in Pennsylvania did that without permission and just told me afterwards. That's, <laughs> it's easier to get, uh, forgiveness than permission, I, you know, but actually I, I don't do anything on, uh, with, with tech, but we have a lot of people who do, people who like the program, who've done things like Matthew713.com and some other corollary websites that uh, you can find out about. Uh, my website's thenarrowpath.com, but so-called because of this passage. In Matthew 7, beginning at 13, it says, enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. 
You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good, bad fruit. A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That last uh, couple of verses are, I've, I've always thought, the scariest verses in the entire Bible because it talks about people who believed that they were Christians, and Jesus didn't believe they were Christians. What's worse, they weren't just your typical people who believe they're Christians because they were baptized as an infant in some kind of religious institution or because they attended church or because they were born in America or anything like that. These are people who believe they were Christians and had cast out demons in the name of Jesus and prophesied in the name of Jesus and done mighty works in the name of Jesus. We might say, well, fortunately, it's just the charismatics he's talking about. <laughs> but of course, the apostles did those kinds of things in, in these days, and, and many Christians did these kinds of things in those days, and, and therefore he's saying they had rather impressive credentials to, and certainly reasons to believe they were Christians, but they, they were looking at the wrong reasons. They were looking at the wrong evidence. And of course, if you say, well, if that's not evidence, what is? Well, he said, before he said that, he said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, walking on the narrow road, the narrow path, is doing the will of the Father. Now, when we talk about the two paths, we, I, there's some things I want to say about them. One is, uh, one is narrow, and few people are on it, and more difficult. The other is broader, and more people are on it, and, uh, and they lead to different places. Uh, one of the few things I remember from junior high was a short story by uh, Frank R. Stockton, written back in 1882, called The Lady or the Tiger. And many of you probably remember that uh, we had to read that in junior high. It, uh, it left an impression, though it's a very short story. And uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you know it, but uh, it was about a king who had a daughter who was in love with a guy that the king didn't approve of. And so the king had a trial by ordeal that he often used to determine guilt or innocence of, of accused criminals. And it was he'd put them in an arena, and there were two doors. And behind one door was a beautiful maiden who, if, uh, if the man opened that door, he would instantly be married to this. The king would select the maiden that he wanted for the guy. And, uh, and you might say, well, I wouldn't want that door then because I want to pick my own wife. Well, the other door had a tiger, a hungry tiger behind it. So he probably wanted the girl. Uh, even if you didn't like her. Uh, but in this case, the, the king was not pleased with this suitor for his daughter, the princess. But the princess was in love with him, and he was in love with her. And, and so she found out which door had the tiger and which had the girl. Now, behind the one that had the girl, the girl was uh, a rival of hers for this man. So the plot thickens. And so the man was actually put in the position where he had to choose between the two doors. One of them would bring a, a new life, uh, and the other would be destruction. And, and so the, the, according to the story, and it, it ends mysteriously, uh, he looked up at his princess whom he loved and who loved him in the stands, and she indicated a particular door for him to open. And the story ends. You'd think, well, she'd certainly tell him how to avoid the tiger, unless she's, this is actually a story about female psychology, really is what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> we still don't know which one she chose. But we do know that he had a choice to make, and there were only two choices, he had to make one of them. And there's a sense in which when we embark in life, we have to make a choice between two gates that we're aiming at. We're gonna open one, or it'll open to us, or the other one. And to get to those gates, there's a certain uh, separate paths. You don't go the same path 
and then uh, at the end of the path, choose a gate. There's a broad path that leads to a broad gate. Why is it broad? Uh, well, partly because there's so many people trying to get through it. It's got a big crowd trying to go through it. Why? Because it's an easy gate. Because it's the path of least resistance. And Jesus said, many go thereby. Many go by that path because it is the path of least resistance. Uh, morally, probably intellectually, and probably a lot of other ways. <clears throat> we are soft people. And uh, people before us, generations before us, weren't as soft as we are because they had to work hard all day long and more days a week than we do and so forth. But, uh, but they were even at, at that time of a mind to choose an easier path if one seemed available. And a lot of times you choose a path because it immediately appears to be easier or more rewarding in the, in, in the immediate uh, results. But we haven't looked at what is at the end of that path. We don't know what, you know, where it leads to. The path, by its very nature, leads somewhere. And if you follow that path, you end up at the place where it leads. And in this case, you choose between two paths. One of them is broader. One is more narrow and difficult, Jesus said. And the broader one leads to a gate that many people enter into. Most people do. And he said that's the one that leads to destruction like the door with the tiger behind it. But he said that few people are entering at the gate that he's recommending. He said, enter in at the narrow gate. It's a narrower one. Straight or difficult is the path, he said, that leads to it. Now, by the way, technically, the term the narrow path isn't in the passage. It's a narrow gate. But there is a path you choose, and it's contrast with the broad path. So. The narrow path is a concept in this passage, but not an actual terminology of the passage. But, but you get to the end of that path, and, and it leads to life, obviously the preferred choice. So Jesus is saying, at the end of whatever path you choose right now is a gate, and it'll either lead to destruction or it'll lead to life. You get a choice, and I'll tell you which one to choose. God's really good about that when we have choices. He always tells us which one to choose. Some people think that God set up Adam and Eve for failure in the Garden of Eden because he put a tree there and allowed a serpent to be there to lie to them. And, and uh, you know, if he had put the tree somewhere else, we just not made it at all. If he'd done the same thing with the serpent, put him on another, you know, on Mars or somewhere, why put him in the same garden with Adam and Eve? It sounds like God is setting them up for failure. And people have, have complained about that to me. They say, isn't God setting them up for failure? No, he's He's setting up a test. I have had, I've run a school for 16 years, Bible school, not recently, but when I was younger, and we gave tests. We wanted the students to pass the test. In fact, we gave them all the information they needed to pass the test. We weren't setting them up for failure. We were telling them before the test what the answer is. It's like if you went to a college course and the professor the first day said, folks, you're, you're great, is going to be based on one question on the final exam. You'll either pass or fail from that one exam at the end of the course. There's only one question, and here's the answer to it. Now, is that professor setting his class up for failure? No, he's, he's doing everything he can to let them know how to not result in failure. Interesting that God can do so many things along those lines, and we can still make the wrong, we can still make the mistake. It does not speak well for the intelligence of our race. But Jesus is doing the same thing. You, you can't tell when you're young or even when you're old, if you're, if you're very far from the end of life, you can't tell where the, end, what the, where the last gate you'll pass through will lead you. Uh, no one can see beyond that point. But he can tell you which path will lead to that gate that you want. There's another gate, and there's that path you don't want to take. And so that's what he's done there. There's a path that looks more difficult at the moment. And, uh, and it is, in many respects, difficult, but it leads to life, and it's more than worth it. There's another path that's more alluring, more inviting in some ways, more uh, populated. Uh, you know, the, the parties are greater on that one, you know. The, the narrow path, not quite so much. Uh, there's something better than parties there, but, but uh, when a person is making the decision initially, they often don't know what what kind of pleasures exist on the narrow path. They know what kind of pleasures exist on the broad path because everyone they know is doing it. Everyone they know is on that path. Now, 
I will say this, some people have said, Jesus is predicting that not many people will be saved in the end. Big A said there's not many find this. And I just want to disabuse you of that particular idea right away because Jesus was not making a prediction. He's making an observation. He's making a social commentary with a challenge. The challenge is uh, don't go that way where most people are going because that leads to death. There's another way. Most people aren't going that way right now. He, his, his statement is not in the future tense, it's in the, in the present tense. Not many are going there. Few there are who are finding it. Now, in Jesus' day, there were lots of religious people. It was a religious society. The Pharisees were very prominent and uh, visible, and their religiosity was admired by most, uh, although most people didn't like them much because they were you know, arrogant and judgmental and so forth. But people did say, well, I guess if anyone goes to heaven, they will. They're so religious. And so people who would follow that way with the Pharisees, which is the major way for the Jewish people to go if they were religious, were not on the right path. Very few were on the right path. And which was the right path? Well, he is the way. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Those who were following him were on the right path, but they were not a great number of people at that time. Jesus' movement was very small, and it got, even got smaller after that. Um, and he didn't do much to advertise it as a, as a, you know, a pleasure cruise. When the rich young ruler came to him, Jesus said, well, uh, you got to keep the law. He said, well, I've done that. I've, I've kept all the commandments. Here's a rich guy. He'd be a great asset to any church. A ruler, not a political ruler. He's a synagogue ruler. But the thing is, he's a religious man with, with standing in the community. He'd kept the law. There were no scandals in his life. You'll always want deacons and elders that don't have scandals in their lives if possible. Hard to find sometimes, but, and then he was rich. Every church wants a rich elder or a rich deacon or just a rich person to be in the church, if possible, because the church has expenses. So here's this man, and he's zealous. He's running to Jesus. Respectable people didn't run. Men didn't. Children did, but men did not run in that society. But this man is desperate. He comes running to Jesus. What good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, keep the commandments. Which ones? He listed some of the commandments. The man said, well, I've done those already. I'm good. But he said, but what do I lack? And Jesus said, oh, if you want to be perfect, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. Now, the man didn't want to take that step, obviously. And he didn't. And he went away sorrowful, the Bible says. And I, want, I wonder if Jesus was a, a modern Christian, if he would have been kicking himself. And I, I shouldn't have laid it on quite so heavy. I, we could work up to this. How about if you just start with your tithes? You know, and when, and when you see that you, God miraculously allows you to live as well on 90% as you could live on 100% after you tithe, then you'll maybe be inspired to maybe give more, maybe 15%, maybe 20, who knows? Uh, maybe someday you'll just be really zealous and want to give it all away, you know. Uh, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't negotiate. He said, here's the terms for you. Now, he didn't say that's the terms for everybody, but that's the terms for that man. And Jesus' terms really are such, they won't be the same for every person in, in, that, in the particulars. But they are the same for every person in one particular. And that is, Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, Matthew 16, 24. So if you want to follow Christ, that's what it means to get on that path. You're following in a, in a line behind the steps of the master. You're a sheep, and he's the shepherd. If you're following Jesus, you're on that path. That's the narrow path that leads to life. Jesus described his sheep in uh, John 10. I think it's in verse 28. If I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong about the number. But Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. Okay, so if you're a sheep, you're listening to Jesus, and you're following him. And if you are, he's certainly on the right path. He is the path. He is the way. And so as you follow him, you're on that path. The problem is there are difficulties associated with being on that path. And not many people are on it comparatively. You know, it's interesting, uh, in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 8 says that John saw in heaven a great multitude, which no one could number, from every nation and kingdom, uh, uh, kindred and tribe and tongue, uh, and they were worshiping God in heaven. And so obviously there's an in, uh, innumerable number of people who will be saved. But 
they're still the minority. <laughs> they're still not the majority. Most people still prefer the terms of non-discipleship to the terms of discipleship. And there's this passage very much like this one in Matthew in Luke. I wouldn't call it quite a parallel, but it certainly is a time when Jesus was speaking on the same subject and asked about it. Uh, this is in Luke chapter 13. It might even be intended as a parallel, but I, I'm not going to commit to that. But in Matthew, or Luke chapter 13, beginning at verse 22, it says, He went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? Are there few who are saved? They must have been listening to his teaching to have that question arise, because his teaching was pretty demanding. In another place, actually in the very next chapter in Luke 14, he said, if anyone does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. If anyone does not hate father, mother, wife, and children, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. If anyone does not take his, his cross daily and follow me, he can't be my disciple. So no wonder. Now, he said that in the next chapter, but he said stuff like that throughout his ministry. And so someone said, Lord, are there few saved? Kind of sounds like it. And Jesus didn't answer that directly, as sometimes he did not. But he did kind of give an impression. He said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I don't know you where you're from. Now, that does sound a lot like the passage in Matthew 7 that we read. Enter the narrow gate. But here he says, they ask him, are there many, sa are there few saved? He says, well, I, I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to tell you there's a lot who aren't. There will be many who will want to be and they will not be able to be. They will they will desire to enter into that narrow gate. The problem is they didn't take the narrow road, to, which is what gets there. At the end, they will have taken the broad road, and then they want to go through the narrow gate. He says, well, they're not going to be able to. They can protest all they want to, but I'm, just, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember. We didn't get acquainted. You must not have been on the same path I was walking on. We could have gotten acquainted that way. I don't know you. And so apparently they'll be left out. And Jesus' instruction is strive to enter the narrow gate. That's what he says, strive. That's an interesting statement because striving isn't generally speaking uh, how we think of becoming a Christian. Jesus said in another place, come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And he said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And he said, my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is at the end, of course, of Matthew 11. Now, if Jesus said his yoke is easy and his burden is light, how then is the narrow path said to be a difficult path? Is, make up your mind, Jesus. Is, is this going to be hard or easy? Am I going to be bearing an easy and light yoke, or am I going to be striving on a path that's full of difficulty? The answer is both. Both. It, and um, it's kind of like this. If you are somebody, uh, let's say a, sing, a single mom, who's forced to take employment, and you're not trained, you're not employable, so you, you get the, some really lowly, scullery-made kind of a job. You're, you're uh, taking care of a, a, a single man's child and, and, uh, and cleaning his toilets and scrubbing his floors and cooking his meals and doing those things, hopefully washing your hands in between. <laughs> and you have to go to work every day. And you have to get up, and it's a drudgery. It's hard. It's hard work. But then, you and the man you work for discover you're in love with each other. And he proposes marriage. And he's, he's got a child he's taken care of, and he wants to, he'd love to have a, the woman be his, his wife, and, and he'll take good care of her, he'll love her, he'll take care of her child, and she'll take care of his too, and it'll be a, a blended family, and it's all good, and they're in love. Well, as soon as they're in love, she still cleans and cooks and takes care of the children, but it's not the same. When she's just doing it because she has to, because she'll starve if she doesn't do it, that's hard work. When you do it because you're in love with the person you're serving, I hope some people here have had the pleasure of being in love. I have, and I am. And I'll tell you this, when you're in love, there's nothing, no sacrifice that you would not be delighted to make. 
if it'll enhance the life of the person you're in love with. Now, some of you married people, married for years might say, I don't feel that way about my spouse anymore. <laughs> well, you once did. You once did, and shame on you if you haven't continued to. But the truth is, if you are in love, that's almost the obvious evidence of being in love. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Not, if you love me, you'll feel obligated to keep my commandments. You'll just do it because you'll know that's what pleases me and you'll want to please me. Now, is it hard or easy to follow Jesus? It's really hard if you don't love him. And I believe many people in the church have never, maybe even never really gotten to know Jesus. If they don't love him, I'm pretty sure they don't know him very well because to know him, I believe, is to love him. I, when you find people who, it's a drudgery to, to read their Bibles, it's a drudgery to, you know, praise the Lord or, or to, to fellowship with other Christians. You know, I don't want to judge you. I just say, how could that be true if you love him? You know, I remember I was raised a Christian. I was actually uh, raised in a, a church of the same denomination as this one. And, uh, but the one I was in was more dreary than this one. <laughs> and uh, I didn't really, I, I knew the Lord. I gave my life to Christ even when I was a child. And I even preached when I was in junior high because I wanted to win people for Christ. Uh, the church was more dreary than I was, as it turned out. But I, my family moved away when I was 16 to Orange County. There was a big revival called the Jesus Revolution happening there at the time. A friend of mine from school took me to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. It was like at the very beginning of the movement. And I, I found people who loved God and, I, and who knew God. And I realized that while I was a believer and that I was... I was quite sure I was going to heaven. Uh, these people, at least many of them, the ones I met, seemed to really have met God in a, in a powerful way and loved God. And I wanted what they had. And I found what they had, and I got it too. And, and because I, 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 I moved from the place of knowing about God to knowing God, uh, it made all the difference in the world, all the difference in the world. And it made following Christ not only something I believed I should do, but something I couldn't think of anything I'd rather do. People have many times said, I have a real hard time reading my Bible. Can you give me any tips on how to, how to want to read your Bible more? I don't know if I can or not, because when I came to, when Christ came to be real to me in that sense, I didn't want to do anything but read my Bible. I read it all the time. Now, I knew my Bible reasonably well as a Baptist youth, but but, I mean, I really wanted to saturate my mind with the Bible, and I have. I've done, and I haven't stopped wanting to do that. It's, it's, it's food. Peter says, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow by it. You, you crave it like a baby craves for milk, or eventually when you're not a baby, for meat. But the point is, it feeds the soul. Uh, Jeremiah said, your words were found, and I did eat them, and your word was the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Job said, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. David spoke about the law of the Lord. He said, it's more to be desired than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. People who knew God found his word to be nourishing and delicious and desirable. And yet, those people were living under the law of God, which we find a little overbearing when we read it. But if you love God, as Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Not because... I whip you into it, but because you love me and you, you want to please me and you know what pleases me, you do it. It's easy. The yoke is easy when you love the master. But it's a hard course objectively. I mean, let's face it. Many Christians have had to face uh, persecution of various kinds. Sometimes they've been kicked out of their homes because they were Christians, especially in Muslim or, or Jewish families. That's happened a great deal. Or Hindu families sometimes. They get kicked right out of their homes, disinherited. Sometimes that no one will hire them. There have been times in history that uh, Christians, only because they were Christians and for no other reason, they, they couldn't be employed, they were beggars, they were poor. Uh, God always provides what we need, but what we need is often much less than what we would prefer to have. And uh, God has never failed to provide my needs, though I've been, at times in my life, very poor. I'm not very poor right now, thankfully. But I have been, and I, was, I, I just figured I signed up for this. Uh, this is, I was told this is a difficult path. The only reason I'm experiencing this particular hardship 
is because of the choice I made to follow Christ in the way I did. And because um, I, I live by faith in a full-time ministry, so that's, when, when you do that, you get what you get. And of course, there's been other kinds of trials. Many people have trials of sickness. I've been spared those, thankfully. I've not had sickness in my life, but I've had sick relatives. I've had, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've experienced all kinds of co trials of various kinds. And I have to say, not very many of them could have been, uh, could, let me put it this way, almost all of them could have been avoided if I didn't keep to my convictions. If I didn't have a conviction about doing what Christ said to do and following him, uh, the vast, overwhelming majority of the trials could have been avoided. The path does have difficulties on it. It's a constrictive path. Obviously, your own desires have to be reined in. That's a warfare. Peter said, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. Paul talked about it as a wrestling. Uh, he talked about wrestling as uh, not flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. But these principalities and powers often seek to tempt us into things that we think or we're told by the tempter that these will make us happier. And so it's, it's hard to say no to things that we actually feel would make us happy. And we don't see why denying ourselves those things would be a happy route. But the thing about following Christ, there's only one thing about following Christ, is trust. Well, I'm love, but you love him, and that's why you trust him. And when you trust him, you realize that if he tells me this is going to be something I'll be glad I did, I'm going to believe that. I'm going to take that course. It doesn't, if I was working from my own perceptions, I don't think I'd call that the most desirable course. But if he says that's the most desirable course, I trust him. A lot of people don't realize that God is a father, and, and if, I guess it's harder if a person hasn't had a good father, and in our society there's more people than ever who were raised without a good father. They, they may have had no father in the home, a great number of people have had no father in their home growing up. Others have had fathers that were cold or aloof or seemingly selfish or even abusive at times. And so when we're told that God is like our father, for, I don't know how they work that out. I, you got to learn what a father's supposed to be. I fortunately had a good father, a very good father. And, and so when I remember that God, and I'm a father, and I think I'm a good father. I'm a loving one anyway. And uh, I know how a father's heart is toward the child. When you say no to your child, you wish you could say yes. You wish you could say yes to everything the child wants. You want nothing so much as your child's happiness, but you often know that the thing your child thinks will make them happy it's not going to work out the way they think it is. It's going to end up where they don't want to be. You have to, you have to displease them. You have to say, sorry, you can't have that. You can't do that. But the child may, may not understand this until they're a parent themselves, uh, but hopefully if they're smart enough, they can figure it out when they're young. The child has to realize my father or my mother is saying no to me because my father or mother cares for my happiness and is smarter than I am about what leads to that happiness. And if, if that course that my parent, and in this case God, our Father, has chosen for us seems more difficult, there must be a reason. You know, kids who learn to play piano or violin or something when their, kids, their, their friends were out playing ball or something and their parents made them stay in and, and practice all the time, you know, they didn't like that at the time. They, in, in all life, especially if they weren't great music lovers, you know, if their parents were the music lovers and the kids were not, but the kids had to comply with the parents' values and learn the, learn the thing. Well, when those kids grew up, most of them do not resent the time they spent learning. Sometimes they're greatly thankful for it because they didn't have the intelligence or the maturity to realize how rewarding that discipline was going to be when they grew up. Their parents had some inkling of it, and, and, and frankly, if you'd been out playing uh, you know, tag in the, in the yard with the other kids at the time, that wouldn't prepare you for anything that you're happy to have now. That's just a diversion. When parents make you discipline yourself, make you say no to certain things that are attractive to you and say, I want you to do this, the parents are not just trying to rain on your parade, the parents are trying to do what they know will be most rewarding and fulfilling in the long run. And that's, of course, how God is. That's why Jesus called God our Father. Do you know that Jesus was the first 
in, in Jewish society to really uh, use the word father prominently as a reference to God. Isaiah had said, oh God, you are our father and we are your children, meaning Israel. God was the father of the nation of Israel. Or, or, or David had said, like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. So God is like a father. But the Jews generally thought it was a little over familiar to refer to God as father and not quite so, uh, not quite so reverent. And when Jesus came and started talking about God as his father, they wanted to take up stones and stone him for that. They thought that was way too familiar. But he not only did that, he told his disciples, your father, even in the Sermon on the Mount, he's always telling his disciples, your father knows you have need of these things. Your father, you know, will not give you a stone when you ask for uh, bread. Your father, your father, which of you fathers being evil would not give good gifts to your children? How much more will your heavenly father give good gifts? Jesus is trying to get across this. If you know something about fathers, this will help. God's a father. The Jews didn't, Jews didn't think of him that way all the time, but Jesus did all the time. Uh, there's two things Jesus talked about more than anything else, and both about equally. One is the kingdom of God. The other is God the Father. And uh, these two are obviously very closely related because he wants, we have to know God as a father whom we can trust. We have to know that he's got a father's love for us. And he will not tell us to do hard things unless he knows we're going to be glad we did when it's all over. Uh, immature people are concerned mainly about short-term immediate gratification. Delayed gratification is not a value with children, foolish children. Wise children, they're mature above, before the time, perhaps they do value delayed gratification, but parents always put that first, if they're good parents. That's why parents discipline their children. The children don't like it, and the parents don't like it either. But they know that if that doesn't happen, their children will be fools and will go wrong. So this is why the path is hard. It is a hard course. My grandson uh, just got out of the Marines uh, just a, like last month, and uh, he, he was in there for four years. And he didn't like being in the Marines much because it was boring. He like had a, a, uh, a warehousing assignment for four years and keeping track of airplane parts and stuff like that. It was very boring. But the part he really liked was boot camp, in, especially Hell Week. I don't know. I don't understand this kid. That's the part I would not like. I'm a wimp. I would not enjoy that. But he, that was his favorite part. He said it was, it was so much fun because he, he was pressed to do things, to do hard things. And uh, today's boys often are not required to do hard things. And frankly, there's something satisfying about accomplishing something hard. You wouldn't usually want to choose it if there's an easier thing you can do and get the same rewards. But often there's, that's not the case. Often the rewards come only at the end of the hard path, the hard choice. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, it's interesting. I found it interesting that he liked that, because I wouldn't. Now, what Jesus tells us about, about not taking the path that most people are on, is telling us to distrust the instincts of the crowds. The crowds are not smarter than you. Young people raised as Christians like I was, like my children were, like maybe many of you were. We get out into the world and we find out most people don't share our convictions. In fact, they frown on our convictions. Maybe they persecute us for our convictions. Never know. Uh, and you realize suddenly, wow, I'm kind, of a, I'm kind of a loner here in this world, in this school, in this job, in this neighborhood, in this country. You know, how many people are there that think like me? Well, fortunately, about many things, there's many Christians in this country who think like we do, but so is you're a Christian in, in uh, Turkey, where you can't find a church, or another Christian, uh, or uh, Saudi Arabia, someplace like that. And you didn't have, and you're the only one who loves Jesus, the rest want to kill you if they find out. And, uh, you know, that'd be, that'd be kind of hard. And the disciples were in that position. They were sticking out like sore thumbs by following Jesus, because he was going against the grain of the, of the religious establishment, and of the world, of course, too calling people to a hard course that some people didn't want to follow. And the disciples, I suppose, probably didn't really want to follow it very much either, but they were obedient to Christ because they loved him. And I believe they're very happy right now. And so you, the, the instincts of the crowds are not to be trusted. It actually says in Proverbs 14, 12, 
And actually, another place in Proverbs, this same proverb is in two places, but I'm going to give it in one of them. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the, is the way of death. That certainly is a commentary on what Jesus is saying. There's a way that most people take because it just seems like the right thing to do. Now, of course, a lot of people take the broad path because it's gratifying, uh, you know, sensually or something like that. But I suppose that the main reason people take the broad path is because most of their friends are on it, or most of the people that they want to be friends with, or simply most of the people that they don't want to reject them and hate them. Most of the people they know are on the broad path. And it's, it's easy if you have no backbone to, by default, just you know, be sucked out with the crowd onto the wrong path. The Proverbs warns against that a number of times. That's, that's why it says there's a way that seems right to a person, but the end is the way of death. In Proverbs chapter 1, if Solomon warns his son, do not go, you know, don't go with the crowd that, that wants to go out and rob people and so forth. And he says, stay away from them. He says, in vain the net is spread in the, in the sight of any bird, which means birds are smart enough not to fall into a trap if they watch it set. And they said, well, this is a trap. You should be at least as smart as a bird and not walk into it. But we're not as smart as birds sometimes. Jesus makes that very clear because he says, the birds don't worry about a thing and God feeds them, but you are, you little faith people. You know, sometimes the birds are, are smarter than we are, but it's instinctive for them, of course, so they get a, it's easier for them. We have to figure it out and make the right choice. And Jesus says, this is the right choice. Follow me, do what I say, you'll be glad you did. You, you can't see the end of that road right now, but I know where it is, and that's the gate that leads to eternal life. And if, uh, you know, if all the people around you are thinking otherwise, uh, don't listen to those false prophets. Remember, he said, beware of false prophets in this passage. They're like, they look like sheep. They look like Christians. But inwardly, they're ravening wolves. They are actually not followers of Christ. But they are on the broad path disguised as Christians. And there have always been those kinds of people, those kinds of churches. I mean, from probably from the time of the seven churches in Revelation. What about that woman Jezebel prophesying in the church there? I mean, in the first century, churches had false uh, prophets in them. And ever since then, sometimes in, sometimes in history, most of the church was run by false prophets. Uh, and there's still plenty today. Right now, one of the things that is very common is for pastors that once were evangelical followers of Christ to begin to be, I guess they call progressive, to deconstruct, they, they basically, uh, you know, they're, they're rethinking everything. I like rethinking things. I don't think you should just follow a church tradition without thought because sometimes church traditions need to be rethought from scripture. But they're rethinking scripture itself. I mean, they're rethinking whether they believe scripture itself or not. And when you get to that point, then you have no authority. You don't even know what Jesus would say because everything he says is up for grabs. You have to think about whether you believe it or not. Uh, well, that, that, there are false prophets with very large churches that are on that path, and people, many there be, that follow them. Some of the biggest churches probably in, in the country are that way. So it's not just that the path is difficult because it restricts your life. It may say, it may make you give up some of the dreams or agendas that you had because you can tell how Jesus is calling you to do something a little, a little more focused, and it doesn't include all those things that you thought you'd want to do. You may have always thought you want to be married, but Christ is calling you to be single, or vice versa. You always want to be single, but God's calling you to get married, or, or to take a different kind of career path, or to, or to be a missionary. I remember when I was a kid, when people gave testimony uh, at church, which I heard this very often, they'd say, you know, when I was first a Christian, I really, I really had a hard time just yielding my whole life to God because I knew that if, if I yielded to God, he'd say, go to Africa as a missionary. Well, I heard so many people say that that I assume there's a certain view of God that he's just waiting for you to become a totally surrendered child so he can give you a miserable life. Now, if you're called to be a missionary in Africa, it may not be a miserable life because if you're doing what God is calling you to do, you'll find you're right in the niche that, that, that you were designed for. God knows what part of the puzzle the piece that is you fits into. And once you fit there and doesn't have to try to force into a place that doesn't belong, it's quite comfortable, really. 
But I, I never really wanted to be a missionary to Africa, but I, I wasn't afraid to surrender to Christ because I knew that if I surrendered to Christ, if he said go to Africa, it would be the thing that I, nothing else could bring me more fulfillment in life than that. He didn't. I, I have been to Africa, but I, not as a missionary. Um, so the idea is to trust Christ because the path is difficult in ways that restrict our preferences, but it's also difficult, he says in another way, because there's deceivers who look like Christian prophets. They're false prophets. They're wolves, and they're trying to deceive you too. They're trying to say, you don't have to go on that way. This is a different way now. Uh, we live in, a, in the 21st century. We're not living in the first century. Uh, there's actually people who say, we really need to write a more modern. We need to revise the Bible, make it more modern. Uh, no, I don't think that's going to work well for those who do it in, the, in, the, in eternity. I don't think so. So the yoke is easy if you love Christ. And part of the reason is because if you love Christ, you receive his spirit. His spirit en enables you. Remember how Paul in Romans 7 talks about how hard it was to do what's right. He, he, in his mind and his heart, he wanted to do the right thing, follow the law of God, but there was something else in him that just dragged him into the wrong behavior. But then in the next chapter, he says, you know, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For he said that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This is the unique aspect of being a follower of Jesus. It wasn't available to the disciples while he was on earth, but after he left, he sent his spirit, and it's now available to everyone. And, if you, and Paul said in Romans 8 9, if you don't have the spirit of Christ, you're not his. So it's not like a special class of you know, super committed Christians get to have the Holy Spirit. Now, this is the common inheritance of all who follow Christ, his spirit. John says in 1 John, we know that he dwells in us and we dwell in him because he's given us his spirit. Well, what's the spirit do? Well, the spirit uh, works in our heart. He works in us to will and to do of God's good pleasure. It's a lot easier to do it when you want to. And he works on your will. If, you, if you're really born again, he'll write his laws on your heart, figuratively speaking, so that you're keeping God's ways is emanating from inside you. And uh, so, I mean, there's, there's a mystery there that can't be known until you're in the family. But once you're in the family and God gives you his spirit, then you find out, wow, well, I, I, I can please God and I can like it. In fact, I can't imagine liking something else. I never used drugs, but I was in the Jesus movement where everyone I knew used drugs before they were Christians. I, I was never in, I was a Baptist youth leader before I went to, it was in the Jesus revolution. So I had to grow my hair out to pretend so no, <laughs> so no one would know that I had never used drugs because it was a shame never to have used drugs. It wasn't really a shame. It was just like awkward. You know, when a bunch of Christians in the Jesus movement were seeing her, they'd all had drug ammonies, you know, and uh, they could tell. And it was all, it's like they're all talking about how much God delivered them from heroin addiction or from how many hits of acid they used to take on a daily basis and stuff. And I thought, I, uh, no comment, you know. <laughs> I've never done a drug in my life, you know. I was a virgin when I got married. I, I just didn't do the hippie thing. But I didn't want them to know it. So I grew my hair out and... Then they cut their hair and I didn't, so <laughs> go figure. The thing is, though, that it was easy for me not to want to take drugs because I knew Jesus. In fact, I thought, why would anyone want to do that? And some of those people I knew who had taken a lot of drugs before they became Christians and they gave up their drugs, uh, they, they told me that sometimes their friends say, well, what do you do for fun now? You know, you don't come to parties. What do you do for fun? Oh, we go to Bible studies. And, you know, like Peter says in First Peter, they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excessive right speaking evil of you. They can't understand that. Until you know Christ and love Christ, you can't know how easy it is to love the things of God. Keith Green said, if you love the Lord, you'll love his will for you. And uh, that is so true. I mean, that's so totally true. And speaking of uh, Keith Green, I'm not going to do a Keith Green song, but I do want to do a song, and I, I have not done this very often. Uh, a long time ago, I used to be a Christian musician. I gave it up to become a Bible teacher. Uh, but, there, but a lot of songs, all the songs I know are like from the ancient Jesus movement times. I don't know any modern ones, but, but uh, Larry Norman, we did a song by Andre Crouch that, that's from that era tonight, today. But Larry Norman and Andre Crouch were like the very first, the very first of the Jesus rockers, but Andre Crutch is more rhythm and blues and, and 
uh, Larry Norman was more of a soft rock kind of a guy. But Larry Norman, uh, who's now deceased, uh, was the first one who put out a, a Christian album that was kind of rock and roll. It's called Upon This Rock. And, uh, and I knew some of his material. But one of his songs is so suited to uh, what, what I'm talking about today, I asked if I could play it at the end. I'm going to have Pastor Jim come up first. But I want to say this, too. Uh, this song uh, alludes to a, a poem. Another thing I learned in junior high. Uh, I, I only learned two things in junior high. I mentioned the lady in the, or the tiger. And the other was the poem by Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. And that's, uh, that poem, I'm not into poetry much, but that poem has always been moving to me because, and he wasn't talking about Christ, but he just said, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the road less traveled by. And it's made all the difference, he said. And uh, I came to that point uh, pretty much, I mean, as a child, I didn't understand the choice I was making. When I was 16, I came to that point. And I took a road that was less traveled by than most others, and uh, it's made all the difference. I wouldn't trade it. And I certainly would recommend that the narrow path is the, the path uh, that leads to life. All right, I'm going to turn this over to the pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.